Oh my goodness. Wait till you see what we have in store today. We got some rootin' tootin' fun. Now don't forget, kids, you need your fair book. And wait, I've got mine. Let me show ya. This right here. All you gotta do is give it a print skis, and then you've got it, and there's all kinds of activities inside. Now, don't forget to print that. Now, I bet you're real excited to find out what we have in store today, and let me tell you, it is cool. We're gonna go over corn and fish and pork and some really cool things of our Colorado, our beautiful state, the industries right here. And let me tell you, that sounds like a lot of outdoor stuff, and um, I better get my hat ready for today. <gasps> oh my, that's just tissue paper. Well, I think I can use a little bit of magic and a little bit of creativity and make this tissue paper into a hat. Let's see here. Little Ripsy there. <laughs> little Ripsy there. Well, I know you're looking at me funny thinking, what on earth? Well, Mama told me you can do just about anything with a little effort and a little imagination. And I think I got some pretty good tools here. Let's see, let me get a little crumble. Now, I don't know if you know, but fishing, that sun can get real bright and I don't wanna burn my beautiful scalp. So let's see, okay, let me get a, let me see here. Do, 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 do. I think this is gonna be absolutely magnificent and look ever so pretty. Woo! I think I'm ready for our outdoors activities. Now, I have got some special guests today. And also, I want you to remember, you can get involved in the fair too. All you gotta do is get online and sign up for our junior ambassador program. That's right, K through 12, you got an opportunity. Now, I bet y'all wanna learn about some fishing and I have Ambassador Tracy here today and I gotta run and give my fish a bath. Bye y'all. All right, well, All right. that was pretty cool. I don't have a fun hat like she's got, but I am here today to talk to you about fish adaptations and some of the cool fish we have in Colorado. So in order to do that, I'm going to share my screen here. And show you guys some fun information. Okay, I think that is coming up. Adele, I'm not sure if that's full screen or not. There we go. All right, so my name is Tracy Predmore. I am the education coordinator for Colorado Parks and Wildlife in the Southeast region. And if you joined in yesterday, you met Erin Kendall, also from Colorado Parks and Wildlife. But just as a quick reminder, so who is Colorado Parks and Wildlife? Well, we are the state agency that is responsible for managing 42 awesome state parks that are spread across the state, including Lake Pueblo, which is based in the hometown of Pueblo for the state fair, which is pretty cool. And we also uh, manage over 900 species of wildlife which includes amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds, and fish, which is what we are talking about today. So before we get started, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I do need to mention that of course, part of our mission is actually to educate because we feel it's really important to educate you and your families about the cool wildlife that we have and the great natural resources that you find here in Colorado. So before we get started, I do want to just go over two words that I'm going to use pretty frequently. One is adaptation. We're going to be talking about fish adaptations and basically that's the uh, adjustments in either behavior or what the fish looks like or its internal structure to be able to survive well in its environment. 
And then the other word that we're going to talk about is habitat. And that is basically a plant, animal, or organism's home. And it provides all of the food, water, and shelter for that plant or animal. And of course, for fish, that means some sort of body of water. And if Colorado has great uh, places for fish to live, obviously, we've got rivers and lakes and streams and ponds and fish are adapted in all different ways to live in those different environments. Okay, so really quickly, let's uh, go ahead and I'd like to hear from you guys what you think it is that makes fish unique from all other species. So in the chat box, if you will type something that makes fish, that is unique to fish, makes them different from other species. And I don't think I can see the, share, the uh, chat box. So if one of our moderators would be willing to uh, let me know some of the answers that are coming in. Okay, so I can't see the chat box. Oh, there we go. I don't think I have the chat box open. So um, hopefully, well, let's just go ahead and jump into some of those answers and I'll bet you guys know most of them. But so a couple things that make fish a fish, obviously are that they don't have legs like the rest of us, right? They have uh, fins that help them move up and down and side to side in the water. They also have scales. Uh, now some fish like catfish or uh, sharks have a smooth skin, but for the most part fish have scales and that's what helps protect their body. And of course one of the most obvious is that fish cannot breathe oxygen in the air like we do. They breathe, they get their oxygen from the water. So that oxygen goes in through the mouth, over the gills, which is underneath that gill flap there, and that's where they absorb the oxygen. Now, another couple of cool things to note about fish is that they can smell underwater, and they do that through their nares, which are like our nostrils. So that's why if you go fishing, sometimes you might find fishing bait that has different scents because fish can smell. Another really cool thing about fish is they have taste buds, just like we do, but they're not always located in just their mouth. Sometimes their taste buds can be located on their face or even on their fins, which I think is pretty cool. Wouldn't it be great to, to be able to look at a piece of broccoli and be close to it and know whether or not you liked to eat it without having to actually take a bite just because you have taste buds on the outside of your body. So that's pretty cool. And the other thing is they have a lateral line, which is the line that runs down the center of the fish. And it's basically a spidey sense for fish. So it's a fluid filled organ with hair like sensors that allows them to detect movement around them without having to see something. So they can tell how far away it is, how big it is, whether it is a predator or prey, which is pretty darn cool that they have that ability to do that without actually seeing something. All right, so fish also have further special adaptations that help them survive in their habitat. And one of those things is their body shape. So the body shape of a fish will tell you a lot about where they live. For example, northern pike have what we call a torpedo-shaped body. So fish that are torpedo-shaped are long and skinny. Uh, they have fins all over their body because they need to either uh, move fast because they're predators or they uh, are wanting to move in fast moving water like a stream. Okay, and Macy, I can see you are raising your hand, but I cannot, uh, unless you, you type a question, I don't think I can address what you need. So uh, what else? What other body shapes do we have? 
Okay, so we have what is called a vertical disc. These are fish that live in a lot of uh, vegetation, a lot of plant life. So they have a skinny body from top to bottom, and that allows them to be able to wiggle through plants and get away from predators or chase prey if they need. We also have flat bottomed or flat bottomed belly fish. And those are fish that live on the bottom of a lake or reservoir. And so their belly is flat so they can move over stuff on the bottom without tearing up their scales or skin. And their fins are located more on the side, again, so they don't tear those up while moving on the bottom. We also have humpbacked fish like our razorback sucker. So this is a fish that lives in fast moving water but wants to remain still. So that hump on his back helps him stay upright and not, he doesn't have to move like a trout does through fast moving water. And then lastly, there is the horizontal disc fish. We don't actually have any of these in Colorado, but these are true bottom dwellers. Uh, they, the top side of the fish is where their, their gills are and their eyes are and their bottom, uh, unlike a, a catfish, which is also bottom dwelling, it does not have any eyes or gills on the bottom side of the fish. Okay, another cool adaptation that fish has is, is camouflage. So just like uh, birds and mammals that use fur or feathers, they use the coloration on their scales to help them camouflage into their environment. So one type of camouflage is a uh, light bellied fish like a rainbow trout here. So this allows him to be swimming above a fish and the, when the fish below him look up, that light belly blends into the sunlight and he's camouflaged into that sunlight and they can't see him. And the opposite of that is a dark backed fish and this allows fish um, to be underneath other fish and they blend into the bottom or the dark water below them. Now you'll notice on the walleye, he's, and same with our trout, he had both a dark back and a light belly. So he's got camouflage that helps him blend in pretty much no matter where he's swimming in the water. Some fish have a lot of striping, either vertical or horizontal, because they live in areas where there's a lot of plant life. And again, that helps them blend into those plants. And then lastly, we have modeled coloration. So those spots on that back, as well as the color of the trout. So this is a, a trout that lives in fast moving streams. And so he blends into the pebbles and the rocks that are found in those streams. And then lastly, we have mouth shape. So mouth shape gives you a lot of indication as to what a fish actually eats. So we have fish like our northern pike who has what's called a duck bill jaw. So imagine a duck with lots and lots of teeth. That's what these guys have. So he's got a, a big upper and lower jaw with lots of teeth and he is able to grasp his prey with those, those teeth. We also have fish uh, that have a lower bottom jaw. Now this is a really small fish and it is kind of hard to see, but his lower jaw is larger than that top jaw. And that is because he eats fish from the, or excuse me, uh, plants and insects from the surface. So he likes to skim along the surface of the water for mosquitoes and is able to just grasp those into his bottom jaw. We also have some fish with just a plain old large mouth like our large mouth bass. And he basically goes behind a fish, opens his jaw and is able to just swallow his prey. And then lastly, we have a downturned or sucker shaped mouth. Again, these are our bottom dwellers like our catfish who go along and suck up the sediment and the plants and the uh, aquatic insects on the bottom of a lake or a river and filter it through their mouth. Okay, so really quickly, let's look at a few native fish for Colorado and their unique adaptations, and then I have an activity for you. So uh, let's start with the Colorado state fish, which hopefully you all know what that is. And that is the uh, greenback cutthroat trout. And these guys, like I mentioned before, live in fast moving streams. So they have the torpedo shaped body 
and they have fins located all over their body so that they can move fast in the water. And they have a light belly with a dark back, which helps them camouflage along with that mottled coloration that helps them blend into the rocks around them. Now they get their name from the blood red stripe that's found under their jaw, which you can't see in this picture. These guys eat insects and other uh, fish. So they, like I mentioned before, they wanna be able to move fast to catch other fish and they've got big jaws to be able to swallow those fish. We also have the green sunfish. So these guys are found in southeastern Colorado and they live in ponds and lakes. And this is a vertical disc fish. So he's skinny up and down, so from top to bottom. And it's because he lives in an area where there's a lot of vegetation. So his body allows him to move in between those plants easily, along with the coloration on his body that helps him blend in. He also has a very large mouth because he eats uh, insects and other fish. And then the other one I wanna mention is the white sucker. The white sucker lives uh, also in southeastern Colorado in rivers and streams. He is a bottom dweller, so he's got a flat belly and his fins, you can see there, his side fins are, are more to the side instead of on the bottom so that he doesn't tear them up. He has a black or a dark green back so that he blends into that bottom of the river or stream and fish have a hard time seeing him from up above. And then he's got a downturned mouth so that he can filter uh, plant material and aquatic insects from the bottom. Okay, so now that you guys know a little bit about fish adaptations, I would like you guys to create your own fish. And you can do this by drawing a fish or take items from say your recycle bin, like a paper towel roll or a pot can and turn it into a fish. But you've got to answer a couple of questions. So I want you to think about what the name of your fish is going to be. And you can make a fish totally up. It doesn't have to be a real fish, but I want you to think about the things that we just talked about. So name your fish. I want you to think about where it lives so that you will be able to decide what kind of body shape it has and what kind of camouflage it needs. And then what does it eat? So that'll help you figure out what the shape of the mouth should be. And then lastly, what other cool adaptations does it have? And what I would really love is if you guys, after you draw or create your fish, if you would actually email it to me, a picture of it, I would love to see what you guys come up with. My email is Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y dot Predmore, P-R-E-D-M-O-R-E -E, at state dot C-O dot U-S. And really quickly, what I will do is I'm gonna show you two examples of some fish that uh, some kids designed. So one of them here, this is, let me see if I can get it to show. Maybe. Oh, my Zoom screen, and there we go. Okay, so this is the Colorado kelp fish. Uh, if you can see that. I think my zoom screen is not allowing it to show. There we go. He's the Colorado kelp fish. So you can see that this fish uh, kind of looks like he lives in a kelp forest. And so that's what his, um, one of his unique adaptations. This is a fish that is a scavenger. And so his jaw, he's got lots of teeth in his mouth as well as a big jaw so he can eat whatever he finds. And he also lives in an area that has lots of lightning. So he's got these cool stripes that are going down his body and that helps him blend in his environment as well. Okay, now I can finally see the chat question. So um, the questions are to come up with a name of your fish, think about where it lives so that you know what, size, what type of body shape to give it, and also uh, think about what it eats so you know how to make its mouth. Okay, this one is called the shiny wiggler. This guy has a long skinny body because he lives in an area that has a lot of plant vegetation, which you can kind of see here. Uh, and he is a predator. He's got a really big mouth with lots of teeth, but you'll notice his bottom jaw is larger than his top jaw. So again, he can skim stuff from the surface. But his coolest adaptation is that he has a very shiny body that reflects sunlight. 
So the way he really goes about hunting is actually uh, blinding his prey. And once they're blind, he's able to gobble them up. So those are just two examples. And again, I would love it if you would email me your, uh, your fish and I will go ahead and put my email in the chat box so everybody can see and I will go ahead and list um, those different uh, questions that I have as well so that you guys can do that once you are done. Um, I see somebody asked, do fish eat meat? So fish, uh, many fish are predators. They will eat other fish and some of them are scavengers. So yeah, if, if something else were to like a, a pike that has a lot of teeth, I would bet that if, if uh, a bird were to fall into the water, they might try and eat them. So uh, let's see what else other questions do we have? Um, when fish are camouflaged, wouldn't they see the fins? So depending on the fish, uh, you know, their camouflage could extend to their fins, um, but a lot of times their fins are a little bit opaque because they're pretty thin. So they would, they probably blend into the water as well. All right, well, I think I am just about out of time. I hope you guys learned at least one cool thing about fish today. And before I leave, I am going to play a quick video for you guys that shows uh, kids holding a fish for the very first time. While we're waiting for that video to come up, I see somebody said, can fish fly? Um, there is a fish called the flying fish, and while they really cannot fly, what happens is they, they live in the ocean and they get moving really, really flat, really, really fast, and then they jump out of the water, and they're, as they're moving forward, because they're moving so fast, it looks like they're actually flying, but they don't really. However, you could come up with a fish that, uh, if you want to draw a fish with that adaptation, that would be pretty cool. Okay, I will kick it back over to the State Fair. Again, I hope you enjoyed and learned something new about fish today. I to go get my fishing on. My hubbalicious is always telling me I need to come on down to the river and throw in a lure. Not really my thing, but maybe now it is. That was some really neat information. Thank you again, Tracy. Ooh, I'm very excited. Circus Imagination was with us yesterday, and they're back with us today. Now, Carol taught us how to make a tiger face painting. How fierce was that? Rawr. And today, she's going to do something real special. She's going to do a butterfly. Now, before I introduce Miss Carol, I've got my special butterfly bag here, and it looks like, oh, it's empty. So, um, I better get to catching some butterflies. Let's give it over to Carol. Hello, everybody. 
My name is Carol from Circus Imagination, and today I'm going to teach you how to do a butterfly face paint. It's really easy. You're going to need some basic face paints for this. I would start with black and white and three of your favorite colors. For me, I'm using pink, blue, and purple. I'd also suggest you have two types of brushes, a wide bristle brush for the under layer of the paints and a thin brush for the black outlines. I also finished my face paint with a little bit of glitter. Let's get to it. So we're gonna put our brush right there and slide it up. Now for the bottom, I want you to follow your face. So smile and we're gonna follow this line right here. So it's gonna be a down and swish. There you go. Now I want you to get a little bit what's left of that white paint. And let's fill in just a little bit of that butterfly wing right there and right there. So I'm going to do just a little bit of pink. So I have enough space for my next colors. Now we are going to do a little bit of blue all around. Oh, at the top, I want you to do two bumps. One bump, two bumps. They're half circles and then fill them out from the out in. Now for the bottom, it's gonna be one bump and just connect to the end. So bump and connect to the end. Now fill in the bump in the end. And it looks like we have the base of our butterfly ready. Get your brush with black paint angle it up, start in the middle of your butterfly, and in one big swish, just go around the wing. Doesn't need to be perfect. It's okay, whatever happens. Just be confident and do one swish. Here we go. Done. Now for the bottom, same thing. Get your paint in your brush, start in the beginning, and just do one swish. You see, I gave mine a little twirl at the bottom. Now let's outline the outer wing. So it's gonna be one, two, three bumps, connect. You can do it one at a time, or you can do them all at once like I'm doing now. One bump, two bumps, three bumps, connect. Start in the middle of the forehead, go up a little bit and a little twirl. Here's one. For the other one, the second, I like to start a little lower and do a half a curve and a twirl on the top. For finishing touches of our butterfly, we can give her some beautiful white dots right here. subscribe to our channel. See you soon. Howdy, y'all. 
How y'all doing today? <laughs> Wasn't that so exciting? <laughs> Carol is fantastic. What a beautiful butterfly, which I think I caught. Oh no, where's my butterfly? I know I caught it. Um, hold on, let me just think really, really hard and mm, look really, really, <gasps> oh, there it is. There's the butterfly. Now, some of you who are 18 years of age and older might be playing this game. Check out the code today. It's Woofy. Thank you so much, CSU Woofy. Remember, Woofy. Now I'm gonna put my butterfly bag down. Do, do, do. That was so exciting and so fantastic. Now, yesterday, y'all might remember yeah, that's right, yesterday, because today is day two of the Colorado State Fair camp, we had a special guest named Camille that was teaching us all about copper and some really neat things with mining. Well, today, we're gonna teach y'all about salt mining. That's right, the little tiny yummy delicious that spices up your food and brings it to life a little bit more. That's right, let's hear it from Team Pluto about salt. A young boy is about to learn a painful lesson. A world without salt means a world of hurt. Da -da -da -da. Salt saga. Did you know that about 40% of salt produced each year is used as road salt? Bet you didn't. The solution of water in dissolved salt has a lower freezing point than pure water. So putting salt on the roads makes them less likely to freeze. In the United States, each year, there are over 100,000 injuries from accidents on snowy streets, so salt is a really important mineral. Salt contains two elements, sodium and chlorine, that are connected together by a bond. If a lot of salt molecules are connected together, they form a crystal and a mineral called halite. Humans and animals need some salt in their diet, but besides being used on roads and on food, there are many other uses for salt. It is used to make plastic, paper, glass, polyester, rubber, fertilizers, bleach, soaps, detergents, dyes, and cosmetics. But there are many more we can get into. There are lots of different types of salts, including table salt, rock salt, dendritic salt, and sea salt. Some salt is mined through deep shaft mining. This salt is in deposits in ancient underground seabeds that become buried over thousands of years. <coughs> After the salt is removed, a conveyor belt hauls it to the surface. Most salt produced this way is used as rock salt, which usually contains inedible impurities and is often used on roads. Most table salt is mined through solution mining, where wells are built over salt beds or domes. Water is pumped into these beds to dissolve the salt. The salt is then a solution, also called brine. It is pumped out and taken to the plant for evaporation. When the water evaporates, the salt is left behind and it is dried and processed, ready for shipping. Salt mining of both types produces a lot of jobs. Besides just miners, there will be people who do all this stuff too. This makes salt one of the most important minerals. We need it to survive, it keeps us safe on dangerous roads, and it gives people a lot of jobs. For the sake of the world, don't go light on the salt. This has been a sodium chloride production. Wow, that was so cool. Thank you so much for that. Now, I'm having a lot of fun and we are learning all kinds of things. And learning about salt and mining reminded me of something. Now, my hubalicious, he's a miner, and he taught me a stretch that I'd like to share with all of you. So everybody stand up. All right, now stretch out, make sure you're not touching any furniture or anybody next to you. We're gonna do my favorite mining stretch. All right, I'm gonna do it once, 
You're gonna learn it and then we're gonna do it again. So two times, are you ready? Here we go. We're gonna hammer at the rocks, hammer at the rocks, hammer at the rocks. Then we're gonna scoop up the rocks, scoop up the rocks, scoop up the rocks. Now, there's fallen rocks. So you gotta duck the fallen rocks, duck the fallen rocks, duck the fallen rocks, and repeat. You gotta hammer the rocks, hammer the rocks, hammer the rocks, and gather the rocks, gather the rocks, gather the rocks, and don't forget, duck the fallen rocks, duck the fallen rocks, duck the fallen rocks, and hoo-wee, I'm tired. That's right, that's what they do when they get ready for mining, and there's different forms of mining too, which is oh so cool. So everybody take a deep breath, <sighs> and get snug and sit on down, because we have got our Director of Agriculture here with us today, once again, our Ambassador, Jennifer. Check it out. Hello. It's my pleasure to join you again today and lead our agriculture activities for the day. Let me bring up my chat box here just so I can make sure everything is working. Great. Again, my name is Jennifer Sharpie and I am the Executive Director of the Colorado Foundation for Agriculture. The Colorado Foundation for Agriculture, or CFA for short, is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that implements the Agriculture in the Classroom program across the state of Colorado. Do any of you live on a farm or ranch? Or maybe your grandparents have a farm or ranch? It is becoming less and less common for youth to have an agriculture background. Actually, it is said that today's young people are at least four generations removed from a farm or ranch. So if you have any questions throughout today's presentation, feel free to put those in the chat feature. My coworker, Melissa, the education coordinator for the Colorado Foundation for Agriculture, will be monitoring the ag-related questions and comments, and will we'll respond to you in the chat. All right, to start off today, we are going to learn about the pig industry and pork production. Do we raise pigs in Colorado? Why, yes, we do. In fact, hog production is Colorado's eighth top agriculture product. The Colorado pork industry generated $166 million in 2017, according to the Colorado Department for Agriculture. Now is a great time to have someone watching with you gather the supplies needed for today's activity. We'll do this in a little bit. The list of activities and supplies can be found on the Colorado State Fair Day Camp webpage. Today, we will be going hog wild as we make a pig feed sack. So gather that activity page or take a screenshot of the ingredients listed here. And when selecting your, out your ingredients, please be cautious of any food allergies you may have. Ever wonder what it's like inside a pig barn? One of the things we may miss about the Colorado State Fair this year is seeing all the animals at the Colorado Department of Agriculture Ag Pavilion building, especially the baby pigs. I miss them too. Our friends at the Iowa State Fair had a virtual fair too, which was held earlier this month. For their virtual fair, the Iowa Pork Producers Association created a virtual experience to take us inside a farrowing barn and still see the baby pigs. Let's check this out. Welcome to a South Park. The farm behind me is a 2,500 hectare south farm in Iowa. Did you know pigs are raised indoors? 
We house them in barns like this. We are in a farrowing room. What is farrowing? Farrowing is the process of giving birth um, for pigs. We house our sows in what we call a farrowing stall. And this stall really helps to protect our piglets. As you can see, sows weigh a couple hundred pounds. And our babies, they're just two or three pounds. So we don't want them to get stepped on or laid on. So we use this farrowing stall to protect the mom from laying on or stepping on her piglets. So the sow has her own space and the piglets, they have their own space so they can run around um, and not worry about getting stepped on. That was neat. Did you notice how loud it was inside that farrowing barn? And aren't those baby, those little piglets cute? I've always liked baby pigs. Now it's time to learn a little bit more about pigs. So who was with us yesterday? If you were, then you already know what to do. Open another web browser on your phone, tablet, or computer and go to www.menti.com. From there, you will need to put in the code 3208700. So that's 3208700. You'll want to keep this browser open throughout today's camp and we'll come back to it in a little bit. So I'll give you a few seconds to get set. You want to give a little heart or like if, um, if you're on our Menti screen. Good, we got some there. Okay, great. Keep on going. And Melissa, if you'd put the instructions and the, and the code in the chat box, that'd be great. And I'll keep going. So we are going to play a fun game called Truth or Hogwash. I will show you a statement on the screen and using your Menti, select the response truth. If you think the statement is accurate, select the response hogwash if you think the statement is false. All right, are you ready? I'm gonna give you 20 seconds for each one, so you'll need to be quick. Here's the first question. Pigs overeat and really pig out. Is this truth or hogwash? See our responses? Okay. Oh, we're almost close there. The answer is hogwash. Pigs stop eating when they have reached their energy requirements. When compared to humans, pigs eat more frequently throughout the day and in smaller amounts. All right, let's go on to the next one. A hog is ready to go to market when it weighs between 260 
to 280 pounds. Is this true or hogwash? I gave you a little bit more time this time. Look at that. We have most everyone saying true, one response saying hogwash. The answer is true. Most market pigs weigh between 260 to 280 pounds and produce about 140 pounds of consumable meat. All right, next one. Hogs lay in the mud because they are lazy and dirty. Is this why hogs lay in the mud? They lazy and dirty. All right, you all are getting the hang of this. One true. Rest say hogwash, two truths there. Kylie in the chat says hogwash. All right, the answer is hogwash. Pigs roll in mud or water to cool off. Pigs do not have sweat glands and cannot cool down by sweating. As the mud dries down their skin, water evaporates and cools the pig, as well as providing a protective barrier from the sun. Because even, even pigs can get sunburned. Next one. Female hogs called sows are pregnant for three months, three weeks, and three days before giving birth. Is this truth or hogwash? If you don't know, just guess. What do you think? Truth or hogwash? Wow, you guys are smart. This is true. Sows are pregnant for about 114 days before they give birth to a litter of piglets. Each sow has, has on average 10 to 14 piglets. Okay, a couple more. Pig heart valves are used to replace damaged human heart valves. Is this true or hogwash? Yes, Kylie, I can see you responding. Do pig heart valves, can they be used for human hearts? So we have hogwash is what you all answered. What's the correct? It is true. Heart valves from pigs are used to replace diseased or damaged heart valves because they function the same way as a human heart. Great. And I saw someone raise their hand and I can't see that now. So if you just want to put your comment or question in the chat box, that would be great. All right. Pork products produced on farms in the United States are only used in our own country. Is this truth or hogwash? Oh, we've got all, everyone saying hogwash. Couple seconds left. Kylie says hogwash as well. And hogwash is correct. Pork products from the United States are shipped all over the world. Japan and Mexico are the leading buyers. In order to gain one pound of body weight, a pig must eat two and a half to three pounds of feed. Is this truth or hogwash? What do we think? Most are saying true, a couple of hogwashes. Got some trues on the chat. The correct answer is true. 
pigs gain one pound of weight after eating two and a half to three pounds of feed. This is called feed conversion. Pigs are fed carefully balanced rations matched to their age and weight that consists of feeds such as corn, barley, and soybeans. A ration is the amount of feed consumed by one animal in one day. We'll learn more about this in just a little bit. Okay, here's our last question. Chewing gum, crayons, bristle brushes, and drum heads are all byproducts of hogs. Is this truth or hogwash? Truth or hogwash? Ooh, a lot of hogwashes. What do you think? Take a guess. You got nine seconds. A couple are saying true. The correct answer is true. The parts that cannot be used for food, like the blood, bones, hooves, hair, hide, and fat, are used to make these byproducts. A byproduct is a secondary product made from what would otherwise be wasted. How did you do? How many did you get correct? Thanks for participating. We'll do more mental interaction a little bit later on. Okay, now it's time to do our pig feed sack activity. Get out that activity sheet and your ingredients. We'll be completing this together. Pork producers rely on nutritionists, engineers, and other farmers to help build a healthy diet for their pigs. These diets are all scientifically formulated and measured out carefully so that each pig gets the appropriate amount of feed for its nutritional needs. A swine nutritionist makes a balanced ration or mix of feeds for the pigs to eat so they get all of the nutrients they need. A swine veterinarian takes care of the pig's health, a hog farmer takes care of the pigs every day, and an ag agriculture engineer helps the they're designed the barns and automated feeding systems so they have a place to live and something to eat. Those are four great STEM careers in pig production. Nutritionist, veterinarian, farmer, and ag engineer. All right, let's, let's do our activity. We're gonna go hog wild. The pigs need six feeding components to stay healthy. Those are water, carbohydrates, generally from field corn, protein, typically from soybeans, vitamins, minerals, and fat. So those six components, water, carbohydrates, protein, vitamins, minerals, and fat, do they sound familiar? They are the same components that you and I need to eat every day to stay healthy too. Okay, it's time to mix up our pig feed ration. I have all of my ingredients over here, and I hope you do too. Be sure to wash your hands or sanitize your hands um, before you get started. Okay, I have my pig feed sack here, or my snack bag. Our first step, is to measure out a third cup of marshmallows. I'm using mini marshmallows. You can use jelly beans or an eighth of a cup of dried blueberries. Okay, those over there, there's my marshmallows. Put them in the bag, perfect. Pigs drink up to six gallons of water per day depending on their growth stage. Nursery or baby pigs drink much less than a sow, which is a mother pig nursing her piglets. Okay, next is to add a cup of your chosen cereal ingredient to represent carbohydrates. I'm gonna use pretzels. You use whatever it is that you have. All right, little pretzels going all over the place. Add those. 
remember to take pictures so you can use them for your state fair or your junior state fair ambassador application. So a carbohydrate is a source of energy in the diet of the animals that comes from sugars, starches, or cellulose. All right, third step, we're gonna add a quarter cup of nuts or a half a cup of cheese crackers to represent protein. I'm using peanuts, but again, if you have a nut allergy, use cheese crackers or cheese crisps. All right, there's my quarter cup. Whoops, making a little mess. You can't cook without making a little mess, isn't that right? All right, we'll add that to the bag. Protein is required in the diet for maintenance, muscle growth, and development of fetuses for pregnant sows. Okay, vitamins and minerals are next. I'm gonna add a quarter cup of raisins to represent our minerals. Whoops, that was a third. Here's my quarter cup. All those raisins can go in that cup. Perfect. Great, got them all in there. And then a third of a cup of M&Ms or whatever candy you have. What's great about this activity is you can use whatever ingredients you have available to you. All right, add them M&Ms. Perfect. In they go. And a quarter cup of chocolate chips. I found these cool uh, unicorn chips um, that I'm gonna use, but again, use whatever you have. And in the bag, those go. Perfect. Vitamins and minerals help support specific functions for our body. Oh, and that was fat. Did I add everything? I guess I did. And then fat is used in a pig's diet to add energy, cal calories, to boost, or boost average daily gain and help with feed conversion. Okay, we have everything. Now we got to mix it all up. So mix up your feed sack. There we go. A pig's feed is mixed up well to make sure pigs get all of the nutrients they need in one bite. And yes, some pig feeders, particularly as pigs get closer to market weight, even have automatic water applicator in the pig trough to help the pigs consume water and digest their food. All right, you may enjoy your snack now or save it for later. Okay, I'm gonna stop my share. That's what I have for you on pigs today. If you'd like to learn more about the Colorado pork producers, visit copork.org and then follow them on Facebook. I'll be back in a little bit to talk to you about corn. Thanks for joining camp today. I hope you're having fun. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Wow, that was incredible. I had no idea how essential pigs truly are from saving people's lives enhancement to nutrition value. Wow, thank you so much, Jennifer. Oh boy, fair camp day two. That's right, day two. Yesterday we had one and we're gonna have more the next day and the following day. But don't worry, if you missed anything, you can check it out on our website, that's right, and you can review things that you may have missed. Now, we've got some more things for you today, so sit down, stay comfy, because I'm very excited. I think it's snack time, and I have my friend from yesterday back today to teach us how to make, well, 
why don't I give it on over to him? Let's give a drum roll for Chef Jason. So this recipe is designed to make sure you don't miss out on another one of my state fair favorites. That's right, corn dogs. Now, we had to adapt a little bit today, right? Because when I was grocery shopping, I couldn't find popsicle sticks, but I'll tell you what I found, chopsticks. That's right, so now we're getting an even bigger handle on our corn dog. So let's get in here, let's talk about ingredients. Not a lot today, right? We've got pancake mix. What? That's right, pancake mix. We have cornmeal, we have some eggs, we're gonna add a little bit of water and then the star of the show, some beautiful jumbo hot dogs. Hey, once again, we are frying today. We're gonna fry in our fry daddy, right? We need a little bit deeper oil today. So make sure to ask an adult, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, aunts or uncles, be safe. But hey, let's get cooking. All right, guys, very fast prep today. So we actually heated up our Fry Daddy early, right? And again, look at that, we've got it set. We're on our way to 350 degrees. Now, you can tell, look at that, we didn't fill it all the way with oil, right? Because we wanna make sure we have room to grow. We're gonna fry two corn dogs off at a time, nice and easy, nice and slow to make sure we don't overflow and we keep everything super, super safe. Hey guys, remember, like I always say, keep that recipe nice and close because you wanna make sure you can refer back to this and follow along. So we're gonna go ahead and add our two cups of pancake mix. Now, let's make sure we don't, we don't get a buttermilk pancake mix because I don't know, that might make your corn dogs taste a little weird. Next, we're gonna add two thirds of a cup, one third, two third. We're add two thirds cup of cornmeal, making those hot dogs just taste fantastic when they become corn dogs. Next up, we're gonna go ahead and add two large eggs. So, like we showed you before, our egg trick number one, and number two. Now we're gonna add a cup and one third cup of some water. And you know what, tap water, totally perfect. Make sure it's nice and cold, keeps that corn dog batter even better. So we are set to go. Next up, we're gonna get in here and mix this. And then we're gonna show you how we take our uh, chopsticks, right? Because we couldn't find popsicle sticks. We're gonna take our chopsticks, get these hot dogs set and ready to go. And guess what, oil, it's all ready. All right, kids, here is your chef's tip of the day, hot dog definitely needs to be dry before it goes into your corn dog batter because uh, if it's not, guess what? Your corn dog batter doesn't stick. So we'll go ahead and get all these guys skewered up on our chopsticks and then we'll see you when it's time to get them coated with the batter. All right, you guys, I'm super excited. It's corn dog time. So here's what we're gonna do. Get that corn dog batter all the way into your bowl, right? We're gonna get it all the way up to the top of your hot dog. Now, carefully, we are going in the oil, but look at this. We're gonna go ahead and hold it for a minute. Let that batter puff up just a tiny bit. We want that outside to set. So maybe I'll hold it for, I don't know, 20 seconds or so. And then when it's all puffed up, leave it alone and continue on with the rest of them. This is corn dog happiness. Now we've got two corn dogs frying and it's important to remember, we're gonna do two at a time. It's gonna keep it safer. We're gonna make sure we don't have any oil spattering. So two corn dogs at a time, I would say keeps you pretty safe, but gets you also fed nice and fast. It's sauce time. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take some of my favorite barbecue sauce, right? I've got a beautiful sweet red barbecue sauce that I like. And then I'm gonna go ahead and add some of that amazing Colorado honey to it as well. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and mix this up and guess what? I've got the best dip ever for my corn dogs, which I think is pretty cool, right? So we'll get this all mixed up. We are set and ready to go. But you guys, that was easy. We had supervision from our parents. We made sure we were nice and safe. We fried two corn dogs at a time. I've got a couple extra, so uh, I better get started. Cheers. Mm-mm, delicious. Thank you so much, Chef Jason. I am absolutely inspired, and I feel like I should thank the pork that provided that nutrition for our body. So thank you, pork, wherever you might have been. Oh, my goodness. Not only am I nice and full from that ever so delicious corn dog demonstration, but I just found out that our sponsor, CSU Pueblo, has got something in store for all of you. So check out this short video. Hello, I'm Timothy Mote, president of Colorado State University Pueblo. 
And on behalf of our faculty, staff, and close to 4,000 students, I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Colorado State Fair. CSU Pueblo has been and always will be a proud sponsor of the State Fair. And although this year looks differently than in years past, the State Fair is moving forward with important events like the Junior Livestock Show and Sale, the 4-H Horse Show, 4-H Static Exhibits, and other virtual competitive exhibits. Just like the Colorado State Fair, which has reimagined how this year's events will take place to meet the needs of all participants and guests, at the university, we have reimagined the teaching and learning experience as well for our students. We are offering our students the college experience, but in a more restricted manner. Students have maximum flexibility with course scheduling being available in multiple modalities, including online, face-to-face, -face, and hybrid options, which is a combination of both face-to-face -face and online. Also, students have access to academic support through these various modalities to enhance their academic success. The Colorado State Fair is rich with tradition. This tradition aligns with CSU Pueblo's values, where we're dedicated to interdisciplinary learning and entrepreneurship that elevate our people and our community. At the university, we create life-changing experiences for our students, just like what you experience here at the State Fair. Our mission at the university is to develop students so that they are able to navigate a rapidly changing world. We spend time talking about this, modeling it, and integrating to all of our courses how to be agile, resilient, and solve problems. We believe the State Fair is navigating the world we're living in and will remain a successful staple in our community. We thank you for joining us at the Colorado State Fair. Enjoy your visit. Wow, well, thank you so much, Timothy. All right, I'm having a rootin' tootin' good time with all of you, and we've got some more in store for you. We're gonna learn a little bit more about all of Colorado's agriculture. That's right, our great and beautiful state has got things right here that you see in your grocery stores, and that's right, they were somewhere before they were in your grocery store. So we have got Jennifer coming back to teach us some more, and this time she's going to teach us about corn. So let's hear it from Ambassador Jennifer. Let me make sure I have um, my, let me stop that and redo it. Let's see, stop share. Just wanna make sure that I did it correctly. Okay, make sure I share my computer sound so that you can hear it and All right, perfect, thanks, great to be back. Okay, so now um, is a great time to get your supplies ready for the Making Bioplastics activity. You will complete that activity by attending KM's classroom in just a little bit. With this supply list, what do you imagine we are gonna learn about? Again, if you have those questions, Put them in the chat feature and our chat wrangler, Melissa, will respond. First, let's test your knowledge. It's time for another Menti activity. If you kept your Menti browser open from earlier, you can go back to that now. Or if you're just joining us, open a web browser on your phone, tablet, or computer and go to menti, M-E-N-T-I, dot com. From there, you will put in the code 3208700. We've got a few of you already on, that's great. All right, 
So here is today's question. What products, what are the products that are made from corn? So use your menti to list as many products as you can think of. Go ahead and add them. We go, we got corn starch. You can add as many as you can think of. Corn meal, corn chips, very good. You guys, paint and corn meal and plastic. You guys are a smart group. If you're not on Minty and want to put them in the chat, that's great. Give you just a couple more seconds to put them in. Soda, corn flakes, chips, corn muffins. All right, tacos, chewing gum, corn oil, good job. All right, let's move on. Someone said animal feed, perfect. I'm gonna move on. That was great. So let's talk about the different types of corn. Did you even know there were different types? So sweet corn is the kind of corn you buy at the grocery store to eat. You can eat it off the cob as corn on the cob. You can also buy it in cans or in the frozen food aisle. Fresh sweet corn is found most often during the summer and it is sweet and juicy. We grow excellent sweet corn in Colorado, but less than 1% of corn grown in the U.S. is sweet corn. And this is not the type of corn that we're going to talk about today. Now popcorn is another type of corn. The composition of a kernel distinguishes popcorn from other varieties. Corn in general is made of starch, protein, fat, and water. Water is stored in a small circle of soft, of soft starch in each kernel. As the popcorn kernel is heated, the water builds, the water heats, it builds up pressure and takes up any available room until the outer surface gives way and the water explodes into the fluffy white snack we all love. There are some farmers in, in Colorado that do grow popcorn although it represents a very small portion of the corn grown. I'm gonna show this little video here to show you how a popcorn kernel pops. Wasn't that fun? Now, the most abundant type of corn grown in the US is actually field corn, or also called dent corn. Almost all the corn you see in the fields is this type of corn. Unlike sweet corn or dent corn, uh, dent corn has a hard outer portion about the thickness of your fingernail. The inner portion of the corn kernel is soft and floury. Field corn is referred to as dent corn because of the indentations or dents. You see these dents on top of each corner. Field corn makes up about 99% of the corn grown in the U.S. and in Colorado. More field corn is grown in the U.S. than any other crop, including soybeans. So Colorado ranks Third, or of Colorado's agriculture products, dent corn ranks third, 
generating $532 million in 2017, according to the Colorado Department of Agriculture. All right, let's take a look at this graphic. It shows the many uses of corn. I know it's a little overwhelming, isn't it? That's because there are so many things that can be made using corn. Let's take a look a minute to look this over closely. So we have corn used for livestock feed and some of you mentioned that earlier. More than 40% of the corn grown in the US goes to feed livestock, pigs, cows, chicken, and even fish eat corn. These animals are able to convert the corn into quality protein. Animal protein offers humans more nutritional value than other food products made from corn. Field corn by itself is not very tasty to, for humans to eat, and it has to be converted into another food product for us to digest but animals love the taste of corn and their stomach systems are better equipped to di digest it than ours. But there are some food products that we do get from corn. And you guys mentioned a lot of these, tortillas, taco shells, even the corn meal that we saw Jeff, J Jeff, Chef Jason use earlier. What are some that you didn't know about? maybe chewing gum, salad dressing, any, uh, and many made for breakfast cereals. How about corn products in our homes? Look at all the uses of corn in our home. We have shoe polish, wallpaper, hand soap. Look what it says about diapers. Did you know that corn is used to make some medicines like antibiotics, disinfectants, aspirin? I sure didn't. I'm starting to think that corn is everywhere. Corn is also used to make fuel. Now this is something that I bet you knew, and I did too. Corn can be turned into to a fuel called ethanol. And it is a, it's an alternative to gasoline. About 29% of the corn grown is used in ethanol. Ethanol production uses the starch or sugar of the corn kernel and leaves the high quality germ or protein portion as a byproduct. This byproduct is called distiller's grain and is fed to livestock. Nothing goes to waste in agriculture. Corn products are used in many industries. Look at this maroon colored industry section. What stands out to you there? From the husk to the cob to the kernel, almost every part of the corn plant can be used to make, some, make all kinds of construction materials. See, nothing goes to waste in agriculture. Corn doesn't just come from the earth, it also helps preserve it. Corn is a key ingredient in bioplastics, which help make things like cups and bottles decompose without harming the environment. We'll learn a little more about bioplastics in just a moment. The U.S. exports corn to other countries. Almost 15% of the 15 bushels of corn grown in the U.S in 2016 to 2017 was exported to more than 100 countries worldwide. And then our last section, corn for fun. Crayons, ceramics, glue, and chalk are all made from corn. You wouldn't be able to have many of your school supplies if it wasn't for corn. And here's one to impress your friends with, Corn is used to make fireworks. All right, remember our Menti activity from a little bit earlier? We're gonna do that same activity again and see what you learn. So again, go to menti.com and use that code 3208700. So 
So what are the products made from field corn? Go ahead and give me your responses. You should be able to do them a little bit quicker and we should be able to fill our page now. Corn starch. What is something that you learned? Biodiesel, animal seeds, silage, yes, silage. Especially sweet corn silage or corn silage, actually. They will, um, instead of harvesting the kernels or the cobs of corn, they'll chop up the whole corn plant and use that as animal feed, as Rachel commented on. A couple more seconds, medicine, taco shells, diapers. We got everybody, corn chips, fireworks. I think that's a fun one, plastic. All right, let's go on on that note of plastics. Thank you again for participating. All right, now we're gonna turn over to Cam's classroom and the SU Agriculture Literacy students for our activity. Do you have all your supplies ready? Welcome back, State Fair campers, to Cam's classroom. Jonathan here with Sarah. Today we're gonna to be making bioplastic. So Sarah, what do we need to make bioplastic? The things you'll need for to make bioplastic is cornstarch, corn oil, some water, some food coloring, any color you want, a tablespoon, and a plastic bag. Let's pause for a second and let's talk about what are bioplastics. So the word bio means life. So you take life and plastic and that simply means a plastic made from living things such as corn, oil which came from a plant. So let's get started on our little on our project here Jonathan. So first you're going to take your tablespoon and measure out one tablespoon of cornstarch into your bag. Then you're going to use your tablespoon again. Make sure your tablespoon is clean and measure out one tablespoon of water into your bag. There we go. Then you're going to use your syringe or your dropper and take a little bit of oil and drop two drops into your bag. Great. And then last but not least, you're going to take your, your food coloring, whatever color you like, and drop two drops of that into your bag. Once that's done, you're going to seal your bag, make sure the air is out, and start squishing it around. To make it all, you want all your ingredients to be mixed up really well. So, Jonathan, now that we have all our stuff in here, what, what does it feel like for you? Um, right now it's a little lumpy, but still kind of getting into that gooey phase. Yeah. Sarah, how does it feel whenever you squish the bag? It's kind of, it feels pretty like soft. And there, it does, all the lumps are gone, which is nice. So all these questions that we've been asking each other, refer to your Making Bioplastic Worksheet. Um, just so you can fill it out so you can start getting ready to submit that Colorado State Fair Junior Ambassador. We'll talk more about that later, though. So it Sarah, looks... mine just turned into a liquid. Did yours do the same? Yes, look, that's nice. Awesome, all right. Now we're gonna move on to the second part of this. You go, Jonathan. 
All right, campers, now we're going to take our plastic bags and we're going to go and put them in the microwave for 20 seconds. So campers, it's going to be pretty hot, so make sure that you use extra caution when taking the bag out of the microwave. Alright, so now that we've made our plastic in the microwave and are letting it cool, we're going to talk a little bit more about what are bioplastics. So bioplastics are made from biological materials, from plant starches, cellulose, oils, or protein. Renewable resources are either naturally produced at a sustainable rate, or they can be produced in agriculture at a rate equivalent to the demand or need. Non-renewable resources are made naturally by the earth, but do not renew themselves in time for enough people to count on them. So Jonathan, what are some examples of renewable and non-renewable resources? So some renewable resources, for example, are forests, fish, wildlife, agriculture, plants, and animals. Some non-renewable resources are oil, soil, mineral resources such as lead, cobalt, zinc. Fascinating. Thank you. I think this is ready now. All right, so now that we have our bags and they're cooled off a little bit, I want you to take a second and observe what does your new substance look like now that we've figured up. Well, it looks kind of like, like a little bit stiffer than it was before, kind of more solid. Mine definitely looks like a Jolly Rancher. It does! So if your plastic is cool, knead it a little bit with your hands. So move it back and forth between your fingers. What does it feel like? And describe some of the other properties that you observe. Awesome. Should we take it out? Yeah, for sure. So if it's cool enough, try folding it in your hands and making a shape with it. Or try forming it to make a little ball. Awesome. What does it feel like now that it's out of the bag, Jonathan? So mine is pretty rubbery. Um, so it's still a little stiff, but not too stiff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. While we're rolling out our, our bioplastic, let's go look at why it's called bioplastic. Um, especially these that we're working with now, we use cornstarch and corn oil and water, all things that exist in nature or are produced in agriculture. So corn is grown in the great state of Colorado. So that's awesome to get to use this in bioplastics. So feel free to play with your bioplastics. Continue to form different shapes if you'd like. Be sure to fill out your worksheet for making bioplastics and take lots of pictures for this process. It's been a great time spending time with you today. We hope you had a ton of fun with us and we'll see you next time in Cam's classroom. And be sure to fill out your junior state fair application so that by the end of this week you can become a junior state fair ambassador. That was neat. Who knew you could make bioplastics from corn? For more information about corn and its many uses, visit coloradocorn.com. And Macy, I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead and put, that, put your question or comment in the chat box. So to learn more about the Colorado Foundation for Agriculture, our free programs and resources, including those for virtual learning, for pre-K through 12th grade ed education, or to make a tax deductible gift to support the Colorado Agriculture in the Classroom program, visit growingyourfuture.com. Thanks again for joining the agriculture portion of CAMP. 
and I hope to see you back tomorrow. I'm gonna turn our host duties. Wee. Thank you so much, Jennifer and team. That was absolutely inspiring. Who knew that corn was not only edible, but also efficient for fuel and other oil products? I'm very, very inspired. Maybe I should be a corn farmer. That's all right. I'm going to keep doing my thing, butterfly hunting, banana farming, and all kinds of root and tootin' things. Sometimes they say my name should have been Jill because I'm a Jill of all trades. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Now, y'all, we're having a rootin' tootin' time, and we've got some more in store for you. Yesterday, we had Circus Imagination with us, and today they're back. Now, don't worry. If you don't have a hula hoop, you can imagine that you have a hula hoop, and you can pretend that there's a circle around you, okay? And you can move your hips, but I'm not the professional. Let's give it over to our ambassador, Circus Imagination. to keep 
your hula hoop from Bali is spinning. Own the direction that your hula hoop is spinning. Same direction, okay, you guys? So my hula hoop here is spinning to the left. So hoop's gonna start to fall, and I'm gonna spin to the left. Woo! And it's gonna go back up. Again, the hula hoop starts to fall, and I spin it on the direction the hoop's spinning. And it goes back up. All right, these are the three ways you can keep your hula hoop going. Don't drop it, or if you drop it, just pick it up and keep going. Once you've got this down, you can walk around with your hoop. This is really easy. You're gonna take one step forward when the hook hits your belly. Almost look like you're walking like an Egyptian. Hits your belly. You walk forward. When it walk backwards, when it hits your back, take a step back. There you go. The base is not moving. around your waist, like I just taught you, or you can use other body parts. You can pull hoop around your hands in front of you like this. Just spin your hoop around your hand, however it feels good. You can pull hoop around your arm. You can pull hoop around your elbow. You can pull hoop around your body. That's called passing. So put the hula hoop in front of you, call, hold it horizontally, Point your fingers together, hold it with one hand, pass it around your body, pick it up with the other hand, and pass it in the front. We're gonna just do that around a little faster. It's important to keep your hands, point your fingers together on the front, and pinky fingers together on the back. So we pass on the front, pass on the back. And you can do this slow, and spin with it fast. You do it around your legs, your feet, higher around your body. This is a really cool move. And once you got it down, go and play with it as well as you want. Now I'm going to teach you a move called Around the World. Hold your hula hoop horizontally in front of you with your dominant hand, put it inside the hoop. Lean back, try to spin that hula hoop on your hand right in front of you like this. Your four fingers are inside the hoop and your thumb is up, guiding it around. Look how I'm leaning forward for this so the hula hoop doesn't hit my knees right there. And again, my hand doesn't move. The hula hoop is moving around my hand. My thumb is up. And I only grab it at this point. And I push it around, I grab, push it around, and grab, push it around, and grab. So the whole movement is just with that little push you give with your wrist. And rotate, rotate. Once you get this move in one direction, you can try and learn all the other direction. And then with the other hand. One way. Lean forward as much as you can so your knees don't get hit. And the other way. Once you get this down, you can pass it from one hand to the other. Now I'm going to teach you a move called a break. It's called a break because you stop the hula hoop and you reverse its direction. So the hula hoop is going to the right, you're going to stop and it's going to go to the left. Stop and go to the right. Stop and go to the left. The hula hoop is going to change hands. You're doing pointy finger to pointy finger when you pass it in front of you. You're going to grab the hoop with one hand, fit it on the floor of your back on your waist, and just let it stop. Pass it. Pointy finger to pointy finger. Hold it on your waist. Let it stop. Point your finger to point your finger, hold it on your waist, and stop. That's the move right here. Stop, pass, stop, pass, right hand, stop, pass, left hand, stop. Now, 
when you're able to do it a little faster, the hula hoop's not gonna droop anymore, it's gonna level out, and you're gonna hold and stop on the waist. Pass, hold, stop, pass, hold, stop, pass, hold, stop, pass, hold, stop, pass, hold, stop. And this is called a break because you're breaking the direction of the hoop. It goes to the right and to the left. Practice this move until you feel comfortable. And then we can use all the three moves I taught you today and we can put them all together. Or break. Or around the wall. And passing. All those moves can be worked together. Break, break, break around the world. Break, break, pass. Break, break, break around the world. Break, break, pass. There you go. You just learned how to hula hoop and you learned three amazing, easy moves that you can practice and learn how to do hula hoop dance. It was really nice to have you here with us today. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn more, go on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash circus imagination, and learn more of our tutorials there. Maya, that was a workout. Thank you so much, Ambassador Carol. I am inspired. I'm having so much fun with y'all today at day two fair camp. Remember, we got tomorrow and the next day, days three and four, that's right, tres and cuatro, so come on back now. Now remember, you can get involved in this year's fair. That's right, Junior Ambassador K through 12, Get online, get signed up, and if you do it during fair camp, we'll get you some goodies. Well, it's time for this Tana Mae Pick and Paw to get on out, so I'm gonna boot scoot boogie now.